on the videos rather than in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not knowing you know the that particular website, I did about the same thing. So if you look up, um, I think it's LCD. No, uh, let's see. Let's go to YouTube. If you look up uh, least common factor and possibly my name, you, know, you might be able to find that. No, that's not me. Okay, maybe GC, GCF. What? Some of the props was at the bottom. I'm not sure I listed that under some props. Nope, it's not a. Uh, ah. GCF, can't remember which number I picked, you know, to work out uh, the greatest common factor. But I was doing that, you know, for, for my own daughter, you know, my fifth grader, or you know, then, you know, fourth grader. Because, you know, I, you know, I teach evening classes, so a lot of times I don't have time, you know, at night to, you know, tell, you know, to teach my kids how to do the math. And I know that, you know, at the time she was learning how to do LCM, least common multiple, multiple and GCF, you know, the greatest common the greatest common factor. So I made my you know YouTube clip, you know, at night, you know, when my kid is sleeping, and you know, upload it to YouTube and send a link to her Google account, you know, and tell her, well, watch this, you know, tomorrow, you know, because you know this is going to be useful for your classes. <laughs> so there's a time delay, you know, you know, with with my uh, uh, spending time with my kids. But it worked out, you know, she said it was really helpful. And she showed it to her um, classmates at school and they go like, oh, <laughs> your dad knows how to use YouTube. <laughs> that was just funny. To do, do a viral video of yourself singing Justin Bieber songs, that didn't bring your head. Actually, if you yeah. guys want to watch something, <laughs> <laughs> this is not mine. Okay, you know, I, I have a link to it from my Facebook. Update by. Ah, uh, okay, never mind. Wow, I got nine notifications, which I'll probably ignore. How could you like? Okay, this is not my wall. Let me look at my profile. Like my picture? I have the original file, so I can change my expression, you know, make it angry and all, all that stuff, just by moving the eyebrow and the mouth movement. Yeah. And this is the video I want to show you guys. This is, this is interesting. So let's go to the YouTube site. And this is already turned on, but I think the audio is down. So just hold on a second. This is, this is interesting. This one is actually quite interesting. I think it's actually pretty loud. He says the problem with teachers is what's a kid going to learn from someone who decided his best option in life is to become a teacher? <laughs> he reminds the other dinner guests that it's true what they say about teachers, that those who can do and those who can't teach. <laughs> okay, so let, let me just explain the context you know, of this video clip. Um, this guy used to be a teacher, I think a high school teacher or elementary school teacher, I cannot remember which one. Um, and he became a slam poet, you know, because, you know, I guess, you know, he's good at it. Um, and he's talking about a dinner, you know, with some lawyer friends, okay, or lawyer acquaintances, or some people who just, you know, turn out to be at the same dinner table. And the lawyers were, you know, basically poking fun of, you know, teachers. You know, because you know teachers don't make as much money, and they are you know the the job is definitely not as glamorous, and so on and so forth. So he's basically saying you know what the lawyer was saying, you know about teacher, you know those who can do, who who those who cannot, you know teach. And it goes on from here. It's it's it's, it's entertaining, and at the same time, I think you know a lot of teachers or professors actually you know feel that well you know this guy is you know. <laughs> <laughs> I decide to bite my tongue instead of his and resist the urge to remind the other dinner guests that it's also true what they say about lawyers. Because 
We're eating, after all, and this is polite conversation. I mean, you're a teacher, Taylor. Be honest. What do you make? And I wish he hadn't done that. <laughs> Ask me to be honest, because you see, I have a policy about honesty and ass-kicking, which is, if you ask for it, then I have to let you have it. <laughs> you want to know what I make? I make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. I can make a C-plus feel like a Congressional Medal of Honor, and I can make an A-minus feel like a slap in the face. How dare you waste my time with anything less than your very best? You want to know what I make? I make kids sit through 40 minutes of study hall in absolute silence. No, you cannot work in groups. No, you can't ask a question. So put your hand down. Why won't I let you go to the bathroom? Because you're bored and you don't really have to go, do you? You want to know what I make? I make parents tremble in fear when I call home at around dinner time. Molly, I'm having a call with a bad time. I just wanted to talk to you about something that your son did today. He said, leave the kid alone. I still cry sometimes, don't you? And it was the noblest act of courage that I had ever seen. I make parents see their children for who they are and who they can be. You want to know what I make? I make kids question. I make them criticize. I make them apologize and mean it. I make them write, 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 and then I make them read. I make them spell definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, over and over again until they will never misspell either one of those words again. I make them show all their work in math and then hide it on their final drafts in English. I make them realize that if you got this, then you follow this. And if somebody tries to judge you, Based on what you make, you give them this. Let me break it down for you. Let me break it down for you so you know what I say is true. I make a goddamn difference. Now, what about you? So he's not exactly a teacher anymore. You know, I think he changed his uh, <laughs> profession from being a teacher to, uh, to a slam poet. So he doesn't have to deal with students anymore. Oh, he doesn't make any more money as a slam poet. I do not know. You know, I think that's, you know, that's a hit and miss kind of thing. You know, it's not nearly as reliable <laughs> as being a teacher. Um, so it's just kind of interesting, you know. Um, now, he's, now the, to be fair, the context of what he's talking about is high school or you know, middle school or something like that, and it is not college. And obviously, in a college, you know, as I usually do in the class, I do want people to ask questions because you know, the learning comes from asking questions and answering questions. But when he's talking about questions, I think he's talking about irrelevant questions that people, that students were asking in the class or something that is, you know, just swirling down the class and is not uh, of any value to the class. But I think certain points that, that he made is actually irrelevant, even to, you know, college professors. And it has to do with expectations. You know, the expectation of, you know, what, you know, students should be doing and also what ourselves, you know, should be doing. I think that part is relevant. I think, you know, the low, it, when people lower the expectations, you know, it, the, the results will show, like, almost immediately. Um, I can tell because um, I won't say, you know, which college, you know, but one of our sister colleges, I'm thinking that the expectations are different over there. And that's why, you know, when students transfer or when students over there to try to come over here to take one of our classes here, um, their performance tend to be lower. But at the same time, they expect and say, well, I didn't really do my homework, but I turned in something. I should get some points for whatever I turn in. And it doesn't work that way. I mean, you know, I have, you know, test cases to test their programs with. If it doesn't work with the test cases, they don't get any points. It's not just because, you know, they turn in a file, then they should get some points. But apparently that's the expectation set up by, you know, a sister college. And, you know, so those, you know, students coming into ARC, you know, have basically a culture shock, you know, when they say, oh, I got a zero. Why did I get a zero? Well, because your program did not work. It did not even compile. I could not test your program. So, you know, just a little bit of, uh, you know, video clip that I thought was kind of interesting. 
What do you guys think? <laughs> I, I thought about some of his statements, you know, but instead of you know going, you know, I think he said he mentioned some something about you know you, something about you know your mind and then your heart, so you can follow your heart. Is that, you know, yeah. So you know, with some of my students in CISB three ten, you know, not in this class so much. You know, I haven't checked at least. Um, is you know, you have to click here before it would click here. Because I checked, you know, whether people have been reading the notes in that class, and some people have not been reading notes, you know, for like a few weeks, and uh, that's really bad. For this class, it's not as bad, you know, but for that class, you know, if they miss one class, there's no way they can catch up without, you know, putting a lot of effort in into it. So, anyway. I think we are ready to move on to the next topic. We are ready to move on to types and records. Okay, the test will only test up to subroutines, so, so types and records will not be a part of exam number two. Exam number we are done with the scope of exam number two: arrays and subroutines. Yep. Do you have the like pre-test or whatever already ready? I mean, could you? I that, do not. See what this one is. I think this is just a schedule. Yeah, so there's no, there's no question with this one. I think I'm just setting up the date to remind myself, you know, when we should have an exam. So the exam is going to be not the eighth. It's going to be one week after the eighth. Is it the fifteenth? Yep. I can try to pull some, you know, test. <laughs> No, I, got, no. I got the impression last week that we were going to have the practice today yeah. and oh, next week was okay. the that's exam. So, too, so okay. That's Do you mind if I... No, I don't mind. You can push the test. <laughs> you can push it back. I got two other tests next week, so... <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. So, okay, we can have it in two weeks unless someone you know, complains, you know, major <laughs> and say, you know, I have to have it next week. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Sometimes I have people who can say, I want to have it next week, not the week after next. But, okay. it, but seriously, if, if, I mean, if you could get it, like, make it available, okay. like, maybe tomorrow or whenever, in the next mm -hmm. couple days, so that we can start looking at it before. Yeah. Okay. I can try that. You know, I can, I can pull some of the questions from previous you know, exams and, or previous semesters okay. and just post it here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now we're moving on to types and records. Types and records are very interesting because it can lead to all the other stuff that we can potentially talk about that is not visible to you. But I have all these other sections already grayed out, you know, just because in most of the time I don't have time to go over that stuff. But if I do have time to go over that stuff, I think it will be beneficial to you know students in this class. But before we go there, we have to first deal with types and records, which sets up the framework for everything else after this. Okay. So before we talk about types and records, you know, I really do not like to read my own notes. Okay. And so what we'll do is we'll use a text editor to illustrate some examples. Let me save it to today's folder first, so we don't lose that. All right, so let's let's take a look at some expressions you know that we should know how to deal with. Um, is there a problem with this expression? Do we know how to evaluate it? Yes. Yeah, it's addition, and we have two numbers. And we just have to add them up. No problem. Uh, what about this? Do we have any problems with this expression? Do we know how to evaluate it? Okay. Well, it's not wrong, it is false. Okay, it is false, it is not wrong, but we know how to evaluate the comparison and come up with an answer and say it is false. Okay, um, let's try something like this. Okay, 223 uh, or <coughs> 16. What about this expression here? I don't know what it is. Because the or operator or disjunction what does it expect on the two sides of that? It expects booleans, right? You know, true, false values on both sides. 
And in this case, you know, we don't have true false values. We have numerical integers on either side. So we don't know what it, what it is because the operator is not defined for numerical values. So the same thing can be said about something like this. What is true times false? We don't know what it is because multiplication is only defined for numbers, numerical values. It is not defined for Boolean values. So this is the introduction to the concept of types because what a type is, is it is basically a restriction. It's a specification so that you can specify with multiplication, we need the, the left-hand side and the right-hand side to be of a particular type, which has to be a numerical value. Can be an integer, can be a real number, can be a rational number, <coughs> and so on and so forth. But it cannot be Boolean, it cannot be true, cannot be false. And that's the introduction to uh, the, the concept of a type, which is basically saying, you know, what are the restrictions of values when we use a particular operator? Are we doing okay so far with the concept of, you know, type as a restriction? Okay. <clears throat> so now we are ready to talk about you know, regular types. I'm changing the order a little bit. You know, when you read it, you might want to you know, do the same thing. So we'll talk about some you know, internal types of most programming languages. In most programming languages, they have an internal type called an integer. Integers include positive whole numbers, negative whole numbers, and zero. Examples, okay, you know, we already know what it is. 4.2 is not an integer because it is not a whole number. Pi is not an integer because it is not a whole number. It is not a rational number either. It is called an irrational number. Okay? But they are not integers. But why do we want to focus on integers with a programming class? What makes integers different from, say, real numbers? Easier. Sorry? Easier to work with. They are easy to work with and they are easier to represent. Okay? The whole thing has to do with the representation of numbers. <clears throat> the fractions are a, a whole lot more difficult to represent because you know what we can store in the computer are discrete. We cannot really store fractional numbers the way we you know, write fractional numbers. In other words, you can say 22 over 7 as an approximation of pi. You know, when you can write it down, and that value is, you know, exact. Okay, let me just, you know, say what I mean, you know, on the whiteboard here. When you refer to pi in a paper, you know, in your math proof or something like that, your math professor understands what is the value of pi. Uh, when you say, you know, 22 divided by 7, which is, you know, sometimes used as an approximation of pi, um, this value is exact, okay? This, you, know, you can say 22 divided by 7 is that value that you want to use, and then you can use it to multiply to something, do some simplifications, and end up with an actual value. The problem with storing these values in a computer is we cannot really store the value of pi exactly. We cannot even store the value of 22 divided by 7 exactly because when you store something in a computer, everything has to be stored as a binary number because you know, transistors have two states. Inside a computer, it's either on or off. And that's why when we represent numbers, we also represent numbers as binary numbers, which means we can only represent numbers as zeros and ones. And that's why you know, we don't want to start with you know, these representations, these numbers, because they cannot really be represented exactly inside a computer. But we can represent integers exactly inside a computer. That's relatively easy. And that is why all programming languages that I know of know how to represent integers. Not every single one you know, can understand or represent real numbers. And when they do, there are usually limitations okay, as to what type of precision you know, can be represented when you store you know, a number you know, like pi inside the computer. With integers, we can usually perform you know, a lot of the operations like multiply, divide, add, subtract. We can also compare integers. And the comparison operators produce values of Boolean type and not integer type. In other words, when you talk about 2 less than 3, it does not give you an integer result. It gives you a Boolean result, which is true or false. Are we doing OK with this slide? Okay. So the next slide talks about another type that we have also used in this class. It's called Boolean which is nothing more than you know, the value can either be true or false. The, the result of a comparison 
is Boolean. The result of or is Boolean. The result of and is Boolean. And that stuff, you know, we have seen already. It's just that sometimes we do not refer to it as a Boolean value. We just say it is true false value. The next one is called a string, which for the most part, you know, we don't use in this class, um, but it is useful in real life programming because so far in this class, we, ha we can only represent and process numbers and booleans, which is great for calculation purposes, but when you work with programs in real life, a lot of times you also have to represent text information, like the name of a city, name of a person, the address of a place, and so on and so forth. Those cannot be stored as numbers or booleans. They have to be stored as strings, uh, which is basically you know, text information that you can store in a computer. For the most part, we don't deal with strings in this class. You can deal with strings in your next class in CISP 360. So these are the usual types that are built into a programming language. <clears throat> and now we have you know, another question. Why do we want to have records? In other words, why do we want to be able to define our own types? Okay. To answer the question, let me see if I can find a real form in this classroom. Sometimes they have you know, forms of various kinds laying around. I don't see any at this point. Okay, doesn't matter. Let's, well, it's almost tax season, so let's take a look at a you know, tax form. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at a 1040 easy. And we'll look up the PDF. Because I want to use a form as an example. This is your you know, 1040 easy form. And we have a lot of different fields to fill in. We have you know, first name and initial, last name. If a joint return, your know, spouse's first name and initial, and so on and so forth. We have a lot of numbers to fill in, you know, your you know, bank you know, information, and so on and so forth. OK, this is one single form. What if I tell you that, oh, the IRS has now decided that instead of using one single sheet of paper to put all this information, every little bit of information now has its own little sheet of paper. Okay? In other words, we have one little slip of paper just so that you can enter your first name and initial. There's another piece of paper to put your last name. There's another piece of paper to put your, the, the spouse first name and initial. And there's another piece of paper to put your social security number. There's another piece of paper to enter this number, you know, wages, salary, and tips for yourself. Okay? Um, why would that not be a good idea? There wouldn't be a rain forest. Hmm? There's so many papers floating around that. Yeah, there'll be a lot of paper floating around, okay? And what happens when you have uh, that many pieces of paper floating around? It's easy to make it's easy to make mistakes, right? Yeah. You know, imagine you know you, you're sending in the 10, 1040 easy form, but in little slips of paper instead of you know this form here, and you send it to the IRS. It's very easy for someone to make a mistake and use the wrong item as another number. Okay, but in a form like this, it's it's harder to make that mistake because you know everything has its own place inside the form, and that's why we need records. Okay, because up to this point, we have something that can do a collection thing, which is called an array. But an array cannot take the place of a record, because what is the restriction of an array? Okay, an array is a box. It can contain multiple elements, but there's a particular restriction regarding the elements. What is it? They must be of the same type. If you have an array of integers, then you can only store integers into its elements. If you have an array of booleans, you can only store booleans into the elements of that array. If you have an array of strings, they can only store strings into its elements. You can never mix and match numbers with you know, strings with booleans and so on. But a real form definitely has mixtures of everything, right? You have your name, you have your gender, you have your social, social security number, you have your wages, and so on and so forth. So some of these are numbers, some of these are strings, some of these are Boolean, and so on. So that means arrays cannot get the job done. We need something else, okay? That something else is called a record, okay? So now that we understand you know, why records are useful, 
it is time to you know write programs you know just to show you guys you know what records are and how to use them. So let's go ahead and oh I haven't saved this one yet. It's called post increment, so let's save it as post increment. Let's just say that we want to represent um, time. Okay, how do you represent time? When someone asks you what is the current time, what do you say? You usually you usually say you know what is the hour? You know it's nine o'clock. You know and the minute is fifty eight. So it's nine fifty eight. And sometimes if you want to be extra precise, you can say you know twenty seconds passed. Okay, but that's how you specify the time. Um, do, do you think that the computer internally keeps track of time that way too? No. How, how do you think the computer internally keeps track of time? It uses a very strange way. Yep. With a counter. With a counter, with a single counter. Okay? So it doesn't really store anything in you know, seconds, minutes, and you know, hours. Um, or if someone asks you what is today's date, what do, how do you answer that question? Today's date is April 1st, okay, of 2011, just in case someone has confusion about the year, okay. Hey, some people time travel and they want to make sure that what is the current <laughs> year so that, you know, they know what year it is, right? Okay, but do you think the computer stores time or date internally using the year, month, and day? No. No? Why not? I mean, that seems so handy. But it's not handy when it comes to incrementing, right? Because you have to think about what happens to um, 11, 59, 59. When you add one second to it, PM, okay, 11 PM, you know, 59, 59. When you add one second to that time, you have to roll over not only the second, you have to roll over the minute, the hour, the day, and if that so happens to be the last day of the month and the last month of the year, you also have to roll over, guess what? The day of month, the month, and also the year. Okay, so the logic of incrementing just one second is actually quite complicated. Because if it is in February, you also have to take into account whether it's a leap year or not, and so on and so forth. And you have to do it every single second because you know the internal timer has to keep track of you know the current time at least you know on a per second basis. Most of the time it is per you know ten millisecond basis, which means you have to do this one hundred times per second. <clears throat> and a lot of this calculation is is useless, okay? Because you know internal to the computer, it doesn't really need to know the year, the month, or the day of month. It just needs to keep track of. Is it time for me to do this? That's what the computer wants to know. Is it, for, is it time for me to run a virus sweep again? Is it time for me to back up the files? Is it a time for me to you know, shut down the screen because you know, nobody has been using the computer for the past three minutes? That's what the computer wants to know. It doesn't need to know today's date. It does not know you know what is the hour, does not need to know the minute. Yep. So the world the big thing of the YTK stuff. The Y2K stuff has to do with um, in a database, you know, people still, because a database is entered by human beings, okay, you know, the fields and whatnot, you know, typically are entered, you know, using, you know, a, a person would enter the data, and when it comes out, you know, a person is going to read the data. So a lot of times, you know, inside a database, their date time will be still be represented using our conventional way of representing time. And Y2K has to do with people are using only two digits to represent the year. So after 99, it rolls all the way back to zero. So when, pro when people write their programs and say that, okay, you just have to compare the last two digits of the year to decide which day is earlier, then all those progr programs are broken because, you know, zero, zero is less than 99. But in reality, zero, zero represents year 2000 where 99 represents the year 1999. So when you have programs to try to interpret you know, the time range to see whether it is time to do something, all those programs are broken because you know, they have an implicit understanding of those two digits represent the, um, 
the year within the century of 1900, when when in reality we have to roll over to you know the 20 hundred years. Okay. Yep. So there'll be a Y10K. There'll be a Y10K. Well, I think you know I think people have you know gotten smart and not to use that particular time representation. So. Okay, so let's just say that we want to represent you know, date and time the same way that we usually do. How many integers do you need to represent um, a date? Using our conventional way. You have year as an integer. You have month as an integer. You can use a string, but a string means you know, you can, people can make mistakes. So it's better to use you know, just a number. And you have day of month within a, within a month. So we need three integers to represent a date. And this is how we do it when you use you know, a program to do the same thing. So first of all, we are defining a record type, which is basically a template that tells me, you know, okay, every time we want to represent a date, it will have the following components. The following components include a year, which is an integer. It will include a month, which is an integer. And it will include a day of month, which is also an integer. So what I have done so far is I am creating a template of what a date should look like. This is not a particular variable. This is not a variable. It is a type. I have just defined a user-defined type called date. Are we doing OK so far with the concept? So let's, let's, let's go ahead and see what we can do with a variable. How do we make a variable of the, of the, of the type date? Okay, so we'll say you know, define sub. And for this program, we'll just make it a very fairly simple program. I just called it a stub function. And the stub function has one single local <coughs> variable that we'll call x. And x has a, has a type of date. Now this is something that we haven't seen before. Because all the way up to now, we do not actually say what is the type of something. Okay, I just say local x and it's a local variable. We say by ref y, it is a by reference parameter y. We say by val i, and i is a by val parameter. But we never really have to say what it is. We just say that what it is a local variable, a by reference parameter, or a by value parameter. Now we are going to be a little bit more specific. We say that x is not only a local variable, but we also know that x has a type of date. It is not an integer, it is not a string, it is not a boolean, it is a date. Okay? And inside here, we'll say, well, let's go ahead and try to initialize the year of this date in variable x. So we'll say x dot year gets the value of 2011. This will initialize you know, the year component of the variable x to 2011. <clears throat> and you know, we'll just say that we don't do anything else. And the main program will just invoke the sub function here. Right? <coughs> so this is a really simple program, but it does illustrate some of the important concepts of you know what is what is a type, what is a variable of a particular type, and how do we get to a component inside a variable that has multiple components. So those are the questions that we will answer using this particular trace in sheet two. Um, we don't need comments in this case. We don't need um, global variables because everything are local. We start execution on line 10, which invoked you know, the stub subroutine. The stub subroutine does not return the value, so that means we can use return line number and make it post. It has one single local variable, x. Now, this is the first time that we see something of this sort. What is x again? What is the type of x? Date. It's a date. Okay. And how many components, how many individual items do I have inside a particular date? Three. There are three items. So that means you know, x cannot be stored in one single column. It will need three columns to store it because it has three individual components. The first component of x is the y component, and then we have m, and then we have d. So when you represent x, it is actually a combination of column c, d, and e. 
each one is representing a specific component of a date. Are we doing okay so far with why x is taking up three columns? Now, because x is a local variable, just like any local variable, everything in x are unknown when we first create the variable x. And that's why we have, z uh, we have question marks for columns C, D, and E. Question? Are there any questions at this point? No questions? Okay. Now we can go ahead and continue the execution on line 8. Line 8 says we want to change the Y component of X to 2011. The Y component of X is column C, and this particular column is now updated to 2011. The other two are still unknown. And then we go to line 9, and this is why I said the program is actually not very useful, because you know we we never really get to utilize the result or whatever we put into X, and it's time to deallocate the columns already. And then we return to post. And that's the end of the trace. So you might think, uh, in, and it is true that this program is, is pointless. It, it doesn't do anything useful, except it illustrates a few concepts related to the concept of a record. If you want to know what is date, with the uppercase D, it is a type. Now what we call a type in this class, you know, or what, what we call a record in this class, is also called by many other names in your other classes, okay, in future classes that you'll be taking. Okay, I'll just write down in the spreadsheet here. What we say is a record in this class is also called a struct in C++, in C, which is also called, <laughs> it's being smart. Okay, and see about that. <laughs> okay, it is also called a class in C++ and Java and all the other programming languages. <coughs> it's just an, a term difference, okay? But let's also see what it is called in the kitchen. Kitchen, that, this is a programming class. It's called a cookie cutter in the kitchen. Okay, so what are we doing here? I'm just trying to make you know analogies out of these terms so that you can relate to these terms more easily, not only in this class but also in your other classes. What is that? Hmm, that's interesting. What is a cookie cutter? What what do you use a cookie cutter for? Just to cut cookies, right? Okay. Using the same shape over and over. And using the same shape. Very very good. Okay, so now. What do you think is a cookie in this case? My local variable x is a cookie. It is cut out using the cookie cutter called date. Okay? So what we call a variable in this class can be called you know, a variable also in C. Sometimes it is called an object in C++ because every variable is an object in C++. And what we call a variable in the kitchen is a cookie. Oh. Being smart again. There we go. Okay. So one last thing. What do you think is a column in this class? A column in this class, in terms of a real programming language, is nothing just you know more than just memory. Okay. Every time we allocate a column. That means we have to use up more memory. Every time you have a local variable, it uses up more memory. Every time you have a return line number allocated, it uses up more memory. So what we understand as columns in this class are, is basically memory when it, comes to, when it comes to a real programming language or a real programming environment. What about in the kitchen? It's your cookie dough. Okay? You use cookie dough you know, to make up your variables. But in order to control the shape of your variables, you have to use a cookie cutter. Is that doing okay so far? Okay, so this is an analogy, and I think, you know, some people can remember this analogy, you know, down, you know, to all the other classes, because, you know, you just have to, rem you just have to remember, what is a cookie cutter, what is a cookie, and where's my cookie dough? 
you know, how do I stamp out more cookies, basically. Okay? Now, this is really kind of important because it, it tells you that you can have you know, 20 gazillion cookie cutters in your drawers, but before you cut out a single cookie, no cookie dough is used. Or you can have one single cookie cutter and you stamp out 20 gazillion cookies, then you use up all your cookie dough. So that's the idea behind you know, what is a cookie cutter, which we call a record in this class at this point, or a struct in C, or a class in C++. They represent the same concept. What we call a variable in this class is called a variable in C, although there are you know, different, there are additional things in C that can correspond to a variable, but we won't talk about that in this class. There's also a class, you know, there's object in C++, which is also kind of like a variable in this class, and those things correspond to cookies. But we cannot just say, oh, I'll just grab some cookie and, you know, I'll just grab some cookie dough, roll it into a ball, and make it a, you know, a cookie. Every single cookie must be cut out by some cookie cutter. An integer is a cookie cutter, okay? A boolean is a cookie cutter. A string is a cookie cutter. So everything that you use in a program are stamped out using some sort of cookie cutters. A type is basically a cookie cutter. And what we use a column for is basically memory in a real uh, programming environment. And in the analogy inside the kitchen, it's cookie dough. You can run out of cookie dough if you want to stamp up too many things at the same time. So I'll be doing okay so far with this. So when you look at a trace like this, and that's why date, you know, from line one to line five, is never represented inside a trace. Because when you look at a trace, what are we looking at? We are looking at how cookie dough is used, right? Because every column is cookie dough. It's a part of the cookie dough. And since the template, since the cookie cutter is not really represented here, you do not see date actually represented here. But you get to see the cookies that are cut out using the cookie cutter. Because X is a piece of cookie, it is cut out using the cookie cutter called date, and therefore it has the components that we you know, want to make sure that every date cookie has. Is that doing okay so far? Can you make cookies out of date? As in, you know, the edible date? No. No? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be interesting. Not with a cookie cutter, though. <laughs> Not with a cookie cutter. <laughs> well, make a nice batter out of it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next question is, you know, what can we have variations between cookies cut out from the same cookie cutter? The answer is yes, yes. absolutely. Okay, you, so you can basically, you know, say, okay, I'm I'm going to use co uh, regular cookie dough, pump, 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 co cut out three cookies. But after you cut out the cookies, you can do different things to the cookies. You can add chocolate chip on one, you can add peanut butter to the next one, and you can make the, uh, the next one, you can put the... Uh, uh, hmm? Sprinkles. Sprinkles, you know, onto the third one. So each object, af you know, after you cut out the cookies using the cookie cutter, they can still be different. Just like variables can store different values after they come into existence. Okay? So remember that part too. All right. So this is our first example using, you know, records. Let's go ahead and save it first. And then we'll move on and talk about other stuff related to records. Okay. So records. It's a simple record. And we'll go ahead and, you know, look at another sample program using the concept of records. We'll keep doing the, the same thing with date, okay, since we know how to represent a date already. So it has year, month, and day, day of month. And this is just a cookie cutter, but I'm defining the shape of the cookie cutter. And next, let's go ahead and try to compare two dates. Um, well, let's go ahead and initialize the date first. Um, define sub to date. Um, in order to initialize a date, you have to supply the year, the month, and the day of month. So this is what we'll do. We'll say with pass by reference, 
x, which is a date. Hmm? Questions? Okay. We'll pass by value. Um, in the, we have to specify the year, which is an integer. We have to pass by value the month, which is also an integer. We have to pass by value the uh, day of month, which is also an integer. The subroutine only has to do, you know, just a whole bunch of assignment statements. It has to say the y component of x, which is representing the year, is going to have to be a copy of my parameter year. X dot m is a copy of month, and x dot d is a copy of day of month, and define sub. Okay. Indentation. And now we have you know, our stub function. The stub subroutine is going to define a local variable, which is a date. I'll call this um, today, which is a date. And I will invoke the subroutine init date to initialize this variable today. So I will use today, which is a variable, to specify parameter x, which is passed by reference. I will use you know, the actual date of today, which is 2011, to specify year as the parameter. I will use, you know, today is April, so four to specify the month, and one to specify the day of month. So all we want to do is to find out, you know, how to do this exactly when we trace the program. And outside, we'll just go ahead and invoke the stop subroutine, and that's all we'll do in this program. So this program illustrates, you know, how to pass by reference an entire record type. Because over here, you can see that when we invoke the subroutine called init date, the parameter x is passed by reference, and it is a date. So the objective of this example program is basically to show how to do that. So let's go ahead and trace this program. I think most of you probably already know what it is going to do. Because we are not changing the concept of passing by reference, we are just extending it so that you can also handle record types. <coughs> okay, so let's go ahead and do this. We have line number. There's nothing to say about the precondition because we don't have any global variables. We invoke on line 19, we invoke the stub subroutine, which has a return line number. The return line number is post because there are no additional lines after line 19. We have our local variable today. And today is stamped out using the type called date. So that means today has three components. It has the component Y, M, and D, which stands for year, month, and day of month. But today, as a single variable, takes up three columns. Like that. Because it is a local variable, every single component of today are every single one is in uninitialized um, initially. Then we start execution inside the sub subroutine on line 17. Line 17 is just invoking another subroutine to do to actually do the work. This time we are invoking init date. Init date is over here. It does not return a value. So once again, we can just use return line number. And in this case, the line that is logically following line 17 is line 18. That is that. And it has three parameters. Four. Four parameters. The first parameter is x, which is passed by reference. The other three are passed by value. Year, month, and day of month. According to the invoke statement, one is specifying the day of month, four specifies the month, and 2011 specifies the year. So these three are fairly simple to deal with because they are passed by value. What about x? What do you think, you know, we should, how do we specify x here? x is passed by reference, and I use today to specify <coughs> x. First of all, now that we are aware of the type of something, do the, do the types match up? Do the type of today match the type of x? They match, okay? So that's good. Because if they don't, I don't know what to do with it. If I'm trying to pass an integer, for instance, to x, 
I don't know how it can be done because x according to the 17 init date can only be the reference to a date you know, type of thing. So that means you know, now that we are aware of the concept of a type, when we perform a subroutine call and we have parameters, we have to make sure that the type match. Okay? The type of the argument, in this case today, is called the argument because it is what we use to specify a parameter. Today has a type of date, and then, and then x is called a parameter because it is you know, defined in the subroutine. It also has a type of date. So now everything is okay because they have exactly the same type. The question is now, you know, we know that x is going to be a reference of something. What is it, what is it a reference of? Column C, column E, very good. Okay. Now when we look at column C to column E, do we know how to look at those three columns? Is it possible that we will accidentally look at column C, to, uh, column C, column D, and column E as an array of three integers? No. There's no way we can do that because X itself has a type. X is a reference to a data type, so from that we know how to interpret column C, D, and E. Is that part okay? From the type of X, which is a reference to a date, we no understand how to interpret column C, D, and E because we know what it is. There's no way we can confuse it as an array of three integers. Is that okay so far? Okay. Now that we have set up the columns, we can go ahead and continue execution inside the subroutine. We get to line 11. Line 11 is going to update x dot y. Now the dot notation, there's one simple way to look at this dot notation between the x and the y. It is the same as apostrophe s in English. It's a possessive kind of you know, notation. So in this case, on line 11, all this is saying is x, y gets year. Or if you prefer, the y of x gets year. Is that okay so far about the dot notation? The dot notation is fairly universal. In other words, you will, use, you will see the same notation in just about any programming languages today. Any, any programming language today, everything from C to C++ to Java to Visual Basic to SQL, okay, Standard Query Language, Structure, Structure Query Language to Python to Perl to PHP, they all use the dot notation for this <coughs> purpose, which is great because it is universal. All right, so let's take a look at line 11 and see what we are supposed to do. Year is easy. Year is a my parameter. It has a value of 2011, so that's okay. We know what the right-hand side is. The left-hand side is x dot y. What is x? x is a reference to column C to U, <coughs> which is a date type of object. And we don't, we don't want to access the entire thing because the entire thing takes up three columns. We only want to change the column that corresponds to the, co to the component called Y, which is column C. So that's why in this case, only column C is updated to a value of 2011. Are we doing okay so far with this step? Okay. Next, we move on to line 12. Line 12 says we want to update the component called <coughs> M of whatever X refers to. X refers to column C to E. Within column C to E, column D is the one that matches the component called M, and that's going to get month, which, is a value, which has a value of four. And for the same reason, on line 13, the, compo the component called D will get a value of one. Then we go to line 14, it is the end of the subroutine. So that means you know, we have to continue execution on line 18 after that, and then we ch change you know, all of these columns so that they become deallocated. So, and now we are back to line 18. Line 18 is the end of the stub subroutine, and we'll do the same thing. Deallocate both of these columns, and then remember that we are supposed to continue execution at post, and that ends the entire program. That's the end of executing this particular program. <coughs> All 
Are there any questions at this point about you know how to use a record type? How to pass it by reference? Um, what did the first five lines do? The first five lines? That that's my cookie cutter. That's the shape of the cookie cutter. It does not do anything to the trace because remember a cookie cutter does not make out of it's not made out of dough. So you know, and that's why it does not it doesn't show up in the trace. What would the program do? Like let's say instead of a month number four, instead of an integer, we'll say like let's say April as the word itself. It will not execute it, right? Is that what will happen? Because it's not okay. an integer. The question is, you know, what if, you know, in, in other words, you're asking what if in the invoke statement we pass April yeah. instead of month? Well, the, the question is, do they match the type? Because, you know, you, we know what the type of month is. According to the subroutine, month is supposed to be an integer. That's the type of month. When you pass April, which is a string, to a parameter that is expecting an integer, that doesn't work at all. So that means, what that means is when you try to do something like that in C, C++, or Java, the compiler will complain and say, you know, this is not the right kind of value to pass to that parameter. And as a result, your program, there's nothing to run because the compiler will refuse to give you an executable that will run. In the case of Pro, PHP, and other scripting languages, the program will, okay, it's a more complicated story with your Pro and PHP because you know, those programming languages are not typed, which basically means there's no such thing as matching the type. So nothing is going to happen until you actually try to use the value for calculations purposes. Um, then you encounter problems, which is, which is more troublesome because you know, the problem does not happen when it should happen. It just happens down the line when you need, when you need to utilize the values. But most of you are moving on to CISP 360, so what you need to know is in CISP 360, um, the compiler will stop on this line here and say that the type of April, A-P-R-I-L as a string, does not match the type of month which is expecting an integer, and it will stop right there. Did I answer your question? Okay. Any other questions about this particular sample program? Four is fine. Instead of April, what what what? Please just number four. This is oh, like this one here. Yeah. Then it's fine because four is an integer. The type of the argument has to match the type of the parameter. When they match, then it's okay. Any other questions about this particular slide? Questions? Okay. If there are no questions about this one, we'll go ahead and take a look at a slightly more complicated case. Just a little bit. Every time we you know create a new sample program, all we are doing is to make is to make it just one step more complicated than the previous one, or you know, just to introduce one additional concept. So this one is initializing a date. And now let's take a look at something else. What is a timestamp? When you look at the timestamp of a file, what kind of information is captured in the timestamp of a file? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so we'll go to the home folder. I'll just go ahead and pick out you know, a specific file and look at its properties. You can see that the timestamp, you know, last access time and the last modification time is including both um, the day of month, the month, and the year, as well as the hour, the minute, and the second. Okay, so that means if I want to create a record type to capture a timestamp, I cannot just record the day, the, uh, the year, month, and day, and hour. Uh, I also have to capture uh, hour, minute, and second. But I don't want to you know, do it unnecessary coding. 
In other words, if I look at this new sample program, I can say that, you know, let's just say that for some reason I already know there's a record type of date. So it has year, this is the same as in the last sample program, year, month, and day. Okay, so this is something that I have already. Oh, notation. And let's also say that I have, excuse me, a time record type, which has, you know, hour, which is an integer, minute, also an integer, and second, which is also an integer. Okay. The question now is, if I have these types already predefined, how do I define a timestamp? Well, a timestamp is just, you know, this plus that, because it captures both the date and also the time. So now I have another record type called time stamp. But the time stamp is somewhat interesting because it has a T component, which is a time, and it has a D component, which is a date. Whoa, this is interesting because each component of a time stamp is a record on its own. Yep? Uh, I have a question. Why did the second M in the record time? Why? Why did you say like seconds, same variable? We have M representing month and M also representing minutes. Which is fine, minute. yeah, but that's fine because you can have, you know, a subfolder of a particular name inside a folder yeah. and you can have the, a subfolder of the same name inside another folder. So that's not a problem. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? Have you guys noticed you know, the use of case? Yeah. In the uppercase versus lowercase? Some of you probably have noticed that already. Every time I define a record, the name of the record starts with the uppercase letter. And that's a convention. It's not a rule, it is just a convention. It's a convention usually observed by you know, just about any programming languages. In C, you, know, you do the same thing, the name of a class We'll start with the uppercase letter. In Visual Basic, the same thing. You know, the, the, the definition of a class will also start with the uppercase letter. But when you work with variables, they will use a, they will start with a lowercase character. Okay. Um, it is not a rule, which basically means that if you define a record type using a, the first letter being a lowercase letter, it's not there's nothing wrong. Technically, there's nothing wrong. It's just that you know it does not observe the convention that most programmers use, which basically uses an uppercase letter to start the name of a record type or a class or a cookie cutter. Okay, so what we want to do with this case is first of all, I want to know how everything is represented. In other words, this looks kind of complicated to me. Each component of a timestamp has you know is part, is by itself also a record. So how do we do this stuff here? So we'll go ahead and define a subroutine. We'll start from something. We'll start with something that is easy. All we want to do is to define a local variable, which is a timestamp, and we want to, you know, just initialize the second of this particular timestamp. Now, how do you think we can get to the second of a timestamp? Well, first of all, does a timestamp can a timestamp include the second? Uh, representation. Yeah. The answer is yes. Okay, but how do we get there? Okay, we know that we have to start with x because x is the name of the variable. But which component should we access next? Can we just say x dot s? Go ahead. Sorry. T. We have to go to t first because you know x being a timestamp has two components. The first component is t. The second component is d. D, so we have to get to the T component first. But once we get to the T component, we know that the T component is by itself also a time record. A time record itself has an S component to represent a second. So now we can say S over here and say you know we initialize that to zero. Are there any questions at this point about line 17 of the pseudocode? Remember the dot notation is a pos to be s. Okay, so this is basically saying you know x is the largest object 
it has two components. We go to one of these two, we go to the first one, which has, which has a name of t. Once we get to x dot t, we know it is a time, because according to the definition of timestamp, the t component is a time. But once we get to the time component you know, of record time, we know it has a component called s, which stands for second. So that's how we get to an individual component inside a nested <coughs> record structure. Okay, and define stub, sub, and evoke stub. All right, let's go ahead and track this program down and see exactly how everything is represented and done. Okay, it's not going to be very difficult. And this is, this is not only interesting, it is also a very powerful feature of records, is you can actually include a, co a component of a record can by itself be also a record. And then each of its own component can also be a record. In other words, it's the same concept of a folder containing subfolders, which can contain subfolders and which can contain subfolders. In other words, using this concept, you can gradually build up fairly complicated you know, structures you know, to represent you know, something that is complicated. But each component can still be simpler, you know, and you can just use that analogy so that you don't have like 20 gazillion individual members within a single record. Let's go ahead and look at sheet two and find out what it does. We have line number. The precondition is there's nothing to say because we don't have global variables. We go to line 19. I-19, we invoke the subroutine, we reserve one column for the return line number to go back to post. And now we have to say, okay, but how do we represent local variable x? Well, how many columns do you think x is going to take up? Six, okay? Because, you know, x has two components, right? The first component of x is t, and the second component of uh, x is d. But each component is a composite as well. The t component by itself is a time record, which means it also ne it needs three columns on its own. So this is what it looks like. It has t, the t component, it has the d component. The t component, okay, x itself takes up six columns. And it's probably a good idea just to resize the column so that we can see the whole thing on the screen. Do it this way. Okay, so x itself takes up six columns. The t component of x takes up three columns. The d component of x also takes up three columns. Within the t component, we have the hour, the minute, and the second. Within the d component, we have the year, the month, and day of month. So this is internally how everything is represented, and because it is a local variable, all six columns will start with unknown values. Okay, any questions about this step? No questions? This is all good? Okay. The only line inside subroutine stub is line 17. That's the only line that does anything useful and we want to access x.t.s. This is x, this is x.t, this is x.t.s. This is the column that will get a zero. And we're all done with line 18. You know, line 18 says you know, we have to remember where to go back to, and then it's time to deallocate the columns. That's the end of this trace. Are there any questions about this particular trace? All it does is to illustrate the concept of nesting. You can have a record within a record, within a record, within a record, and so on. Which is very useful and very powerful because once you define what the date is, you can include that into other structures as well. Let's go ahead and save it. And we'll call this record in record.
there any questions? Question? Oh, no, just about how the time would be zero if it came up like that on the timestamp. If it came back to zero as a time. Mm -hmm. Just a comment about it. Oh. <laughs> Well, the year is come somewhat arbitrary, right? I mean, year zero, you know, is, you know, has a special meaning because, you know, of, you know, how we put a meaning into year zero, you know, but, you know, in, at least in theory, the Earth has been around, spinning around the sun, you know, long before that, and, you know, probably, so what we call year zero is completely artificial. Yep. Now, isn't there something like in Microsoft Excel where they count years, or, Day zero as January first, nineteen hundred, and then in Excel's memory, mm -hmm. it just increments forward from there. Very good. Okay. Like yeah. What you're talking about is um, the sometimes it's called an epoch um, okay. time representation, yeah. which is in which is internally how a computer keeps track of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me just kind of get there. Let me close this first. And we'll go to talk about that particular representation. I'll use a text file to do it. Here, okay. Okay, so internal to a computer, time and date is usually represented as in DOS and Windows, it is number the number of seconds since 1980, January 1st. Oh, 1980. Yep, 12 a.m. Okay, in Unix, and also including Linux, including BSD, it will be the number of seconds since 1970, January 1st, 12 a.m. The difference has to do with, you know, when, you know, DOS was first released, as opposed to when Unix was first released. Okay? That's going to be a huge number, don't you think? You know, because we are now <coughs> what, 30 years you know, from 1980 and 40 years you know, since 1970. So that's going to be a huge number. But why do, what is the advantage of representing time as the number of seconds since you know, 1980 or 1970, basically the first second of that particular year? What, what, what do we have to gain using a huge big number to represent the number of seconds since a particular date. Easier to convert to other forms. It would be easy to compute the differences between two times, won't it? Okay, if I want to say, okay, I want the alarm to go off 30 seconds from now, and now is represented as, you know, this particular integer, it's easy to compute you know, what that future time is going to be, because I, all I have to do is to add 30 to whatever the time representation is for for right now, and after 30 seconds, you know that's the time. Okay, so this is what time is represented internally. You know, with your know, most new newer programs, is to use a 64-bit number to represent this this particular uh, time. Okay, so the next question is, how to do? We, how, can we do a conversion between our usual human time representation? to the internal time representation. Well, let's do that once by hand and then we'll figure out you know, how to write a program to do it, okay? Okay, today's date is what? Uh, 19, uh, this, 2011, <laughs> April 1st, and the time right now is 10.46, and I would include a second, which is 20. So let's go ahead and take a look at this and say, you know, how are we going to convert this into the number of seconds since 1970, January 1st, 12 a.m.? Okay? It's not going to be easy, is it? <laughs> okay. So what we need to do is to figure out, first of all, just for this year, just for 2011, how many seconds have elapsed since January 1st, 12 a.m.? of this year to the moment that I want to timestamp, okay? Well, it's not too difficult. How many, okay, first of all, how many days do we have in January? Because we have the entire month of January passed already, right? So we have 31 days for January. And is this year a leap year? No. No, so we have 28 days for February. 
How about March? How many days do we have in March? <coughs> 31 days. And how many days have we seen, have we elapsed since April? One. Zero. <laughs> okay, this is the first day of April, which means, which means, you know, we do not have an entire day elapsed already since the beginning of April. So that's why, you know, we add a zero for April itself, because this is the first day of April. Okay. If the date system has been had been set up by programmers, we would not be calling the first day of a month, you know, day one. We would have, we would have called it day zero because it is zero day from the first day of the month. Okay, you know, it's just because you know humans you know, tend to count you know, as one, two, three, four, or first, second, third, and so on that we call the first day of a month the first. But we really should have called it the zeroth day because it is the first. It is zero day from the beginning of the month. You know, the, the offset is zero. Okay. That's so, so true. Hmm? Some people will never get that. If that was like an implementation, <laughs> I'd always confuse them. Like, how is there a day zero? <laughs> it's zero days since the beginning of, yeah. of the month. Okay. So each day has, what, 24 hours? Okay, so this, is, this number is the number of hours since the beginning of this year to today, to 12 a.m. today. Now I just have to take care of the time since the beginning of today, right? Okay. So what is the what is the amount of seconds you know since the beginning of today? Okay. Let's say uh, this is 24 hours and there are 36 seconds in each hour. So this is the number of seconds since the beginning of this year. What about you know the time from 12 a.m. today to this time here, 10:46:20? Okay, 20 is the second, so we don't have to multiply anything to it. 46 is a second, there are 60 seconds to a minute, so 46 minutes means you know, 60 times 46, and 10 is hour, we have 3600 minutes in an hour. So this is the number of seconds, this part here represents the number of seconds since midnight today. If you don't put a parentheses around the 60 times 46, the number of Multiplication usually occur first. You know that's the priority of operators. In other words, the parentheses should be implied already. We always perform multiplication before we perform addition. Yeah. All right. So that takes care of the number of seconds since the beginning of 2011 to April 1st, 10, uh, 46, 20. Is that okay so far? Now we just have to take care of all the other years in between. <laughs> okay, which sounds like a chore, but it's not really that much of a chore. Okay, so first of all, how many years have elapsed since 1970 to 2011? Okay, that includes the year 1970 itself, right? So we are just counting all the years from 1970, the entire year, all the way up to 2010, the entire year. How many years are we talking about? We're talking about 41 years. Not 40, but 41. Is that right? Okay. So 41 times 365 is the base number. Um, and then we just have to figure out how many of those years are leap. Okay. How many years are leap from you know, 1970 to today? Well, we can just enumerate everything. So we have 74, 78, 82. I know this looks like you know it's a waste of time, but you know this is. I do this for a reason. 96. What about 2000? Is year 2000 year leap? Uh, 72 is actually 72. Oh, okay. Why well, we start backwards? It's a lot easier. <laughs> so we have 80, 84, 88, 92, 96. How about year 2000? Year 2000, year 2000 is a leap year, but it's a very special case of a leap year. How many people know, you know how, to count, how, to, how to determine whether a year is leap or not? Divisible by four. If it's divisible by four, and 
Okay, what if it is divisible by 4 and 100? It's not leap. No, it was. 2000 was a leap year, though. Because, yeah, I, before 2000... Is dad, it a 100 or...? My dad had told me that 2000 wasn't going to be a leap year, but then in 2000, there was a February 29th. Yes, it, it was a leap year, but it's not because it is divisible by, it's not because it is divisible by 4. <coughs> If it's divisible by four, okay. Let, let me let me lock it up because there's that's a there's a rule to it. There's one there's one leap year every so many years that's not a leap year. Right, and there's a reason to it too. All right, there we go. Leap year. Come on, go do the next. Okay, algorithm. If a year, okay, it's because two thousand is also divisible by four hundred. That is why. Okay, if a year is divisible by 4 and not div divisible by 100 or 400, it is leap. If a year is divisible by 4 and 100 but not by 400, it is not leap. If, it, if it's a year that is divisible by 400, it is leap again. So 2,400 2, would be a leap year. And 2,100 will not be. Exactly. Okay. And the rules actually extend well beyond what we see here. It's just that within the near future, all these rules will suffice. And why do you think we have these strange rules that we have it's, to deal with? Because it's not like it's not quite a quarter of a day. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. How? Okay. Let, let me ask you the other question. Let me ask you this question in, in another way. If you look at the number of days, okay, one day is what? One day is one revolution of the Earth, you know, just one time, right? You know, a self-rotation thing, okay? So we call that one unit of time, and let's assume it is a constant, because it really is not a constant, but it's stable enough to consider as a constant. So we look at the, the self-revolution of the Earth as one single unit. How many of those units do we need per revolution for, or per, per trip around the sun once? First of all, is that an integer? No, it's not an integer because we have that one quarter day thing, right? Is it a rational number? A rational number is it has to be representable as a fraction. The answer is no, it is not rational. It is an irrational number, just like pi. Okay? If you want to figure out, you know, as as precisely as possible, you know, how many, you know, days are there in a year? you will never be able to represent it using a fixed number of digits. It is a, it's a re irrational number. So what we have to deal with is, you know, when we want to count the number of years, we can, you know, only count by, you know, number of days. Most people would only want to count by number of days. So that means every four years, you know, you'll be short one day because, you know, because it's not exactly, you know, one quarter. So that's why we have to add one day every four years to make up for that. But that's too much because every 100 years, you have one extra day, or you'll, be, you'll, be have, you'll have one extra day. So that's why one, every 100 year, we have to take one day away. But then every 400 years, it'll be one day too short again. Every 400 years, you have to take away three days. Correct. That's, that's another way to look at it. Okay. And that's because you know the number of days within a year is not a rational number. And this rule, the, the rule that you see here, is only an approximation that is good enough for the near future. Okay? Yep. Go ahead. What's amazing to me is that like the moon the moon rotates and goes around the earth mm -hmm. in exactly the same time period. The moon's period, the moon's uh, rotation around the Earth is synchronous to the Earth's own rotation. In other words, the same face of the moon is always facing the Earth. It, we never see the far side of the moon. Yeah. That's why there's a, there's a far side of the moon, because if the moon rotates differently, then we'll actually see the moon rotating you know, in a so, particular so rate. It's interesting to me that in that situation, mm -hmm. they are both perfectly synchronized. Yep, they are. us circling the sun, Yep. It's not and there are there are interesting theories about you know why the, the moon you know always has the same side you know facing the earth you know some people say that it is a, a satellite left by you know aliens to observe earth you know so all the sensors are on one side and that's why they, they can you know, that's why it's in a 
in an orbit like that with only one side facing the Earth, and the other side can be, you know, interesting stuff. You know, according to the, uh, the, the, the landing craft, they, they, they did actually orbit the moon and saw the, the far side of the moon, and it was not a, an alien satellite on the other side. At least felt like that was camouflage. It's camouflaged, yes. <laughs> there were quite a number of movies and anime, you know, that actually, you know, talk about that and how the moon is actually a satellite or an observation station. Um, everything from 2001, A Space Odyssey, you know, with the monolith thing, you know, that they, you know, discovered in the, on the moon, um, to, uh, what is the name of that movie? There's another movie that you know basically used the moon, you know, and explain why it is like this, you know, because it's actually an artificial object. Um, the the closest explanation in terms of scientific explanation of why the moon is always facing the Earth on one side is, you know, the moon is actually a part of the Earth after a collision, you know, with a with an asteroid, with a big asteroid. So at the time, the Earth is still, you know, in the quote unquote molten state, and a chunk of Earth, you know, was expelled, you know, because of the collision. And that became the moon. The moon is actually getting further and further away from the Earth too. It changed it from a chunk from uh, yeah, it had a ring that hmm? formed into the moon. It was a ring that formed yeah. into the moon. In that case, you know, it probably would end up with a different rotational rate. You know, so I don't know. But it, but when they look at when they timestamp or use a common you know dating of a moon rock, it actually has the same date as Earth. You know, so they they came from the same source. It is it's the same material. Um, the, the moon is basically a chunk of the Earth that somehow got ejected. You know, yep, a long time Earth's ago. Earth's gravitational field be holding the moon in place as it moves, because I think that would be the best explanation to see why it's not spinning. To, you know, for us to see that it's actually spinning, but yet the gravitational field of the Earth is holding it sort of fixed in space. But you can't. But it doesn't work that way because you know the Earth is rotating at a different rate when we go around the Sun. Yeah. So but the central core gravitational field is always the same, though. On the surface, at least. That I do not know. <laughs> but anyway, you know this is a slight digression, and you know, but that's the explanation. So getting back to our math here, we still have five minutes. We can finish the calculation. Okay, so the year 2000 is also a leap year. 04 is a leap year. 09 is a leap year. So we have, what, how many leap years here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Oops. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we have 10 leap years. So the number of days have to be added by 10 because of the leap years. And then all of these days have to multiply by 24 for the hours and then multiply by 3,600 for the for the seconds. So and when you add up these two numbers, that will be the number of seconds since um, 1970, January 1st. Okay? So let's go ahead and do this calculation. If you guys have a calculator, go ahead and do it, but I can beat you. Because I can copy and paste. <laughs> I can cheat. Yes. Well, the next question is, but tech, you can pull up any number here and nobody can verify that, right? Well, let's see. There's a, there's a way to do it inside Pro. You know, I can, let me see if I can uh, pull that up here. And let me find out how to do this in Pro. Okay, Pro uh, time, where else? Timestamp. Even better. Yay. Epoch. Am I off? Hmm. I'm off. Okay, this is April 1st, 2011, and we can you know, change the time back to what it was, you know, the time that we want to use. What was that? was uh, 46, 20. 20. So my calculation is off. I don't know. 20. And 
it's supposed to be 13. I have 10. So my calculation is off somewhere. It has to be the year part that is off, you know, because it's off by that much. It's off by a lot. Would it be the leap year part? Because it seems like you multiplied the 41 times the day. And just let me see. Okay. That's why that's why the leap part is different. This is the big chunk. You know, everything else, you know, this part here is insignificant. Yep, go ahead. So parentheses forty one times three hundred sixty five. Yeah, I think the, the calculator automatically understands that there should be parentheses oh, around okay. here. Okay, well, we can always just do it again. Yep, that was it, that was the, it was the parentheses. Okay, is that the number right? Yep, exactly, it matches exactly. So that's a quick, easy way to verify the answer. So with a 64-bit number, you know when will run out? When will we run out of numbers to represent? Okay. First of all, with a 64-bit number, what is the largest number that we can represent? It's, oh, well, it's, it's two to the power of what? 64 minus one. That's the largest value that we can represent. So the question is, what, is, what does this time you know, correspond to in human years? So we can paste it here, we'll convert that. So this is saying that, oh, it's, it's assuming this is in milliseconds. That's not what I want. I mean, in other words, this is going to be a long time you know, before we run out of you know, seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, but then it will. I, I can just divide this by, you know, 365, and then divide it by 24, divide it by 3600. We have uh, this many years before we run out, basically. And we have how many years? This is a million, and that's billion, right? I mean, let's see. Thousand, million, billion. That's okay. The sun would have exploded already, so we are good. <laughs> because once the sun have, it has exploded, it doesn't matter, you know, whether we count the years or not, you know, because you know the the, the, the period would have changed when the sun have expelled the material. You know, the, the the period of the Earth surrounding the sun would have changed. So even if we have the force field to continue to live on Earth, the number of days in a year would have changed too. And if we had colonized other planets, we would have standardized time counting by then too. That would be a fun thing because you know, if we colonize other planets, most likely we have to take a time dilation into consideration. Yeah. Then you have a new problem of synchronizing time. <laughs> Uh, What's the video work? Homework? Don't forget. That will be homework later. Be homework. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. Let me uh, turn off the recorder first.